right. Um, we are going to continue, and we're going to try to map what we've done in our example in class to the coin example. Um, one thing that is valuable in doing any kind of programming is to be able to take what you've done in one situation and see what parts of it apply to another situation. So in this case, we've done a lot in the temperature conversion that sort of applies to um, your coin example. So we're going to look at, at that and we're going to um, see what we can do. All right, And we'll continue this. So let's look at the example. One FYI, um, I am not going to be staying for lab today, so at the end of class, if you have um, questions about your lab, uh, let's, let's answer them right, right there. Or you can, uh, you know, send me an email concerning them. All right. So here's what we had last time. And we have a text box for the temperature, Fahrenheit to centigrade, centigrade to Fahrenheit. So we can choose between the two different kinds of conversions. What would that be similar to in your assignment? Choosing between the kind of coins. All right. So this the specific calculation that we do depends on which radio button was checked. And in the case of the coin example, the same thing. The particular calculation that you're going to do depends on which box is checked. Um, the temperature, we are just entering in, but we could just as well do a drop down for that. In fact, let's go and let's do a drop down for that because we haven't done any drop downs yet. And that was a requirement, right? Your assignment to have a drop down. So we'll have a drop down. Um, we have a button to do calculations. That's about the same. We have validation. Um, I, you probably will need validation. We have outputting to the screen. Um, so in my mind, there's two things we have missing. We're not using, or two things that, that are missing. We're not using a drop down, and we're not doing anything a repetitive number of times. All right, we are going in and we are changing the way the page looks by adding some HTML elements, but we're not doing it a repetitive number of times like we will need to do with the coins. So let's go and let's change this guy to a drop down. All right. A drop down is actually a select going to change these to DD temp for drop down. We should have to change the code then. And then within the select, there are a list of option tags. Now, each option has associated with it a value. And it has associated with it the text of the option, which I'm going to write out the word 10 here just to differentiate between the two. Because otherwise, we won't be able to see what does what. So let's go in 
and let's just add 10, 20, and 30. Now, what's the difference between the two parts of this? We have the value attribute and we have the inner HTML, if you will, the value of the tag, the text between the start and end option tag. When is each of those used and what are they used for? is used within the script. And this is consistent both on client side and server side. All right, so when we get to server side scripting, the value is the value that the script is going to see. So in other words, if I've picked the first option on here, the script is going to see a value of 10. All right, if I pick the third option, it's going to see a value of 30. Between the start and end option tags is what the user sees. Now, in this example, it's not really earth shattering, right? I could have put 10, 20, 30, the numbers in between there, and it would have been pretty clear what was meant. But sometimes there might be the value that the script needs might be something that's not really understandable to the student. For example, let's say we were going to do a search for courses by faculty ID, all right, or by faculty name. The script may actually need the faculty ID, all right. Now, how many of you know my faculty ID that you could do a search for courses? Probably none of you, right. What do you know? Well, you know my name. So, in that case, what they might do is they might have a list of the faculty members showing their names, and that is the value between the start and end option tag, and the value of the option might be what the script needs. That way, that is, it might be my uh, faculty ID number. Or like in an online store, between the start and end option tag, there might be a description of the product between, uh, or as part of the value um, for the option, the value might be like the product number, or you, you know, is G, is that T-shirt, that is product number AB159. I don't know, you're not going to remember that, right? But you're going to remember, you know, white T-shirt, black sleeves, whatever. All right, so that's the reason for those two pieces. So, interestingly enough, we don't have to change much when we get here. All right, I did change the ID number or the ID value for this, from TXT temp to DD temp. So I need to change that. But we actually don't have to change pretty much anything else. Because the value of a dropdown corresponds to the value of the option that's been selected. Now remember, this is a little bit different than the radio button. Right? The radio button always has that value. Every radio button always has the value that you assign to it. The question you have to ask for a radio button, as well as you must ask for a checkbox, is whether it's checked or not. So different controls we test different things for. The text box and the select, we test the value of it. So we can just say DD temp value for this. For the checkboxes and radio buttons, we say, is that item checked? All right, let's go and take a look. We have our choices, 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees. Let's pick 20 degrees, and let's do Fahrenheit to centigrade. And, oh boy, we got an error. How are we going to figure out what went wrong? I know what the error probably is. The error probably relates to I renamed it in one spot, but not another. All right. How are we going to figure out the error? 
Yeah, I was going to say, we're going to ask someone to help us. And the someone in this case is the browser. And we'll go to the JavaScript console. And sure enough, it says, cannot read property value of null. All right. And that is line. I think it said line 20. And sure enough, if we look at the line in there, I changed the value in the calculation, but I did not change the value in the validation. So if I do that, then everything should be fixed. Again, the idea of Debugging this is you want to take somewhat of a systematic approach. You don't simply want to stare at it or randomly trying to change things until you hit on something that works. You want to have a, a plan. You want to have an idea. And the first thing to do is to look at the JavaScript console, whatever browser you're using. Typically, Firefox and Google Chrome give you a good error messages. So you want to look at those. And usually, you know, it's not going to be so obvious as to say, hey, you forgot to change the name of the dropdown in there. It's not going to be obvious to point to you exactly what the mistake is. But if you learn to read between the lines a little bit, you can identify what the error is. In this case, what the error message was telling me was literally that it does not know what the value is of a null object. Why is this a null object? It's null because there's nothing with an ID of txt temp. All right, remember we changed it to dd temp. So that's effectively what it's telling me. And it's a, some of the, sometimes the error messages are a little cryptic, but if you struggle your way through, uh, at the very least it points in the right direction. Even if you don't understand the verbiage of the error message, it, it narrows it down quite a bit uh, for you. All right, so. I think I changed it and saved it. All right, 10 degrees Fahrenheit to centigrade is, I'm going to trust that calculation still right. All right, I think it is. I should have did these calculations beforehand. All right. Okay, now, how can we validate this drop-down? What if we put a value that says, like, please select temperature, and then if they don't select anything, if it's still on that option? Exactly. Um, a drop-down always has a value, all right? So you can't ask if there's no value. So in this case, when I load the page up the first time, notice the value is 10 degrees. If you can either assign a value by saying selected, so I could make like 30 degrees the default if I wanted to. If I don't, then the top item on the list is going to be the one that's selected. Well, in this case, the top item on the list is 10 degrees, which means if the user doesn't change anything, they're going to get the conversion for 10 degrees. Now, is that okay? Well, I don't know. All right. Remember about setting defaults. You want to set defaults when they make sense, and you don't want to set the defaults when they don't make sense. If you set a default that doesn't make sense, you're liable to get some people lazy and clicking and saving it, you know, when without changing it. All right. If you do not set a default, then everyone has to go in and fill in a value for that field. So you sort of have to decide which is the error that is more likely, what is the error that you want to live with. Now, certainly if we're talking about converting temperatures, that doesn't seem too catastrophic if they get the wrong thing. All right, so we could probably leave this without validation. But if we were going to put validation in, what we would do is we'd do something like this and put as the first value sort of a dummy value. 
that isn't an actual value but a message saying please select temperature now notice the value for that is an empty string which is exactly what I'm testing up here. I'm testing for a value of empty string. So oddly enough, the validation that I used to have is going to work again. All right. Must enter temperature, must pick conversion, must enter temperature. All right. Good to go. All right. There's one more thing I want to do in this example. All right. And again, I don't want to spoil all your fun, so I don't want to I don't want to give you like the answer to to this, you know. But I do want to give you a fighting chance at being able to get it done. So let's try this. Let's output as many if it's above 0 degrees, if it's a positive degrees, let's output that many plus signs. And if it's below zero, let's output that many minus signs. Okay? Good as any, right? So actually we'll we'll do yeah, we'll we'll do that. So how do we do that? Alright. How do we what what I want to do is I want to put either a plus sign or a minus sign somewhere on the page and I want to do it I want to do it a certain number of times all right so if I put in if the the answer was 32 degrees I would want to show 32 plus signs if it was minus 10 I'd want to show 10 minus signs. Okay. So we have a predefined number, we have a, a predefined number of times that we want to execute a block of code. What do we use in that situation when you have a block of code that you want to execute a predefined number of times? A loop. All right. A loop is done for repeating a block of code. And you can use loops all over the place. All right. You can lo use loops to do validation, right? Instead of, like, we're, in this case, looking at these IDs individually, we actually could create arrays that have the names of the IDs and loop through them or something along that lines. All right? So I'm going to go and put... I'm going to put a second results field. All right. And I want to clear out that second results field. that we want to execute our loop. Okay, whatever we call the results, which variable? Answer. Okay, answer. You are correct. The results label has it, but the results label, the inner HTML, has some formatting. It has a strong tag. It has the word centigrade or Fahrenheit after it. 
we couldn't really use that in math, math calculations without doing some tweaking of it first, right? In other words, we look at this. The results label has this in it. It would be difficult for us, or it would be harder for us, to write a statement that says, okay, go and loop through, you know, pluck out the numeric value from it and loop through that many times. So what we're going to do is we're going to answer, however, has that value in it. So I'm going to first assume that answer is a positive number. All right? And I'm going to do this in steps. All right? I'm going to do this, first of all, with... Um, with a couple different blocks of code. Then we'll try to merge it together to do it in one block of code. A fundamental rule of programming, DRY, do not repeat yourself. All right? So when I write this code, when I write this code to do the positive and the negative, we're going to notice that there's a lot of similarities between the two. And that should set off a spark in your head that maybe I can write it better to get rid of the duplicated code. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is I'm going to write if answer is greater than zero. And if answer less than zero. If answer is less than zero, I'm going to say inner HTML equals we haven't gotten that far yet. And I do want to stress again the, the advantage of doing things in pieces. Not necessarily trying to do everything all at once, but looking at a problem, breaking it down, looking at the parts that you know or the parts that you think are going to be easy to figure out, doing those, and then moving on to other sections of it. I think that's a good approach to take. When you're done, you need to have everything work, right? But until you're done, you can have parts of it that aren't done. It's not a problem. You can have parts of it that you just chose not to address at this point in time. All right? And I think that's a good strategy for effectively um, doing code. Think of it again like writing a term paper. You know, you would not necessarily write a term paper all in one swoop. You'd plan it out. You'd do some design. Outline it. You might come up with a rough draft. And maybe in the rough draft you don't explain things completely or, or something. And then you gradually go in and edit it and make improvements in it. Maybe your last check will be to take a look at your paper and looking at ways that you could word things better. Maybe you're not looking for any grammar errors or spelling errors because you've caught all of those. But you're looking at like, gee, I could have worded this different or I could have said this in a more straightforward manner. In programming, that's called refactoring your code, going in and looking to see if, hey, we can take this code and we can improve it. All right, at any rate, I'm going to put the, I'm going to create a variable called symbol, I'm going to put a plus in it. Actually, no, I'm not even going to do that. I'm going to say result string equals nothing. What would the syntax of my for loop be? For. Uh, 
i equals zero, i less than answer, i plus plus. What does this say? This says start off the variable i with the value of zero. Repeat this block of code as long as the variable i is less than the value answer. And each time through the loop, add 1 to i. That's what i++ plus plus means. So, if answer has a value of 5 in this, how many times are we going to execute the loop? Five times, right? We're going to execute it once for i equals 0, once for i equals 1, once for i equals 2, once for i equals 3, once for i equals 4. When i equals 5, we're no longer going to do it. Yes? What if our answer is like a decimal? Does it automatically turn into an integer? Yeah, we're not going to worry about that as a decimal. Because we could, we, if we made the increment, for example, like uh, 0.1, we could actually put, like 10 pluses for each degree, you know, and it would, it would still work. But yeah, and in this case, it's going to, um, it's going to like do up to the near, it's going to truncate any decimals. So like for 6.7, it's going to show 6. All right. So. Result string equals what? Results string plus a plus sign in quotes. Why do you need this result string here? To save what you already had, right? Because each time through the loop we want to add on to that string. All right. If I simply said this, what would I end up with? Just one plus time sign. It would put that one plus sign in 10 times or 20 times or 30 times or whatever. Now, when I'm all done, Result string and we should be okay. What's the difference between a plus sign in quotes and not in quotes here? Plus sign and that post Right. The plus sign here is used like a plus sign. In other words, with strings, the plus sign is used to concatenate. That is, put strings together, uh, add some characters onto the end of the string. In quotes, it's whatever symbol is there. In other words, if I change this to an asterisk, instead of getting five pluses for five degrees, we'd get five asterisks. All right. So let's see this. I will pick 10 degrees centigrade to Fahrenheit. And boom. Nothing. All right. Results string is not defined. Anyone see what I did wrong? string. Yeah. That's the 
one thing that is bad about JavaScript is in other programming languages which are compiled, it would pick up and it would give you those errors and you would have to declare your variables. Here I didn't declare any variable, really. I just started using it. But I started using a variable that I didn't give any kind of value to, so it had no idea what to do with it. So in other languages where you have that are strongly typed, where you declare your variables and um, you declare them as a certain type, then you wouldn't run into this problem. But alas, we do. All right? And that's actually a dangerous thing, too, right? Because if you had an ASP.NET um, application that didn't compile, guess what? It's not out on the web. You can't run it. Whereas you can put bad JavaScript out on the web, and it will run. It just won't work. All right? So it will look like it's working, kind of, but unless you're looking for it, you won't see that there's an error. All right, 68 degrees Fahrenheit, and I trust that's the right number of signs. One, two, three, four, five, six, uh, 31, 67, 68. There are 68 of them. <laughs> now, let's think about this for a second. Plus signs are kind of goofy, right? What could we do? We could make an actual, like, little thermometer here, right? Yeah, we could do, yeah, we could do 68 sunshines. Or, or we could make an image. We could take a little image, a little red block, and stack them next to each other and then have that. So you could play around with this thing. You could, you could have uh, some fun. Okay, it might not be fun, but, you know, you get the idea. All right, let's go look at the negative amounts. So what's different from the negative amounts? I know it's going to be largely the same, right? So I'm going to start by copying that in here. I know that I want to add a negative number there. So this part's identical. This line's going to be identical. This line, instead of adding a plus, I'm going to add a minus sign to the string each time. Do I have to change this loop? And why do I have to change it? I want to go down instead of up, right? Now, that's true. How can I make it so it went up? Convert my answer to a positive. So I could say answer equals answer times negative 1. You know what? You're, actually, you're absolutely right. I'll make a new variable. You're using a Jedi mind trick on me, like, Yes, that would mess with it. Yes, I should make a new variable. And I'll call it loop counter. All right, so now let's go in and Minus 12, 12, looks like we have 12 of them. All right, now, I said this in my class last term, and I like this analogy for those of you that watch Pee Wee's Playhouse as a kid. All right, who watched Pee Wee's Playhouse as a kid? No one did? All right. He had the word of the day, right? And anytime you, anyone said the word of the day, you were supposed to scream. 
at home if you were a kid watching it. As programmers, our word of the day is always the same, and that is repeated code. So when we see repeated code, we should scream. All right? Let's look at the difference between these two chunks of code. Result string equals that. Result string equals that. All right? Loop counter equals answer times one. We don't have anything there, but if we were going to use a variable loop counter, what would we say? Loop counter simply equals answer. Is that the same? Yeah, it will be when we change this. Is this the same? Almost. What's the difference? That. The plus or the minus. And then finally, is that the same? Yes. We could very easily right take this block of code and simply by putting in a couple of variables that we set via an if statement, not repeat the whole block of code and just repeat some small segments of the code. So let's go and do that. If answer is greater than zero, what do we want to do? Okay. Symbol equals plus. And we're going to say loop counter equals answer. What do we do here? Just the opposite. Then, result string equals that. We've already set loop counter. For i equals that, blah, blah, blah. Sim result string plus symbol. All right. It looks like we're in business. Now what does this have to do with your coin example? What will loop counter be? The number of coins that you selected. Do you have to worry about negative numbers in that? No. All right. So that part was unique or distinct to this to this example. What does symbol correspond to? The image. Now, what about the image is it going to be? Which image it is? The name of the image that it is? I'll tell you, that's up for, that's, that's up for you to, to try some things and figure out. All right? But notice in this case that symbol in my case is the HTML code that I want to pop in that result section. So, if I want to make in here, if I want my symbol to be, well, that would be something to try. All right? That would be something to try. If I want a break after each plus sign and a break after each minus sign to make it stack vertically like a thermometer. There we go. Page just got long, right? All right. So I think we have 
seen just about every element of that coin problem. So I'll post this example, take a look at it, and see how you can adapt and, and use the techniques that we covered in class to do this. All right? The biggest thing of this section of JavaScript is understanding how we can grab and test different values from the form because the form is, again, typically how the user is going to interact with the page. All right? And so things like form validation and taking the form fields and doing stuff with them, that becomes important. You were scheduled to have a JavaScript quiz last week, I think. Um, given the fact that I was out the one day and uh, we missed, uh, I think, a day because of weather and all that. We'll have that at the end of this week. So I'll post it probably by mid this week. There already is a study guide posted for the uh, JavaScript quiz. You should be online, yeah. Does anyone have any questions um, about the material in class or about their labs, keeping in mind that I'm not going to be in lab today? Um, is there a way? Yeah. Is it a straightforward? No. No, not really. JavaScript format currency. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's exactly what you'd do, is you'd, you'd get something like that, you'd put it in a function, and then you would call it. Um, normally what works is, is there a, uh, well, let's see, I don't think so. JavaScript round method. So, if I wanted to do it to right, well, a couple things. First of all, you could always cheat on the, your coin assignment. And instead of saying like 30 cents is 0.30, yeah. you could say 30 cents. Oh, okay. All right. The other thing you can do is you can round and then you can, um, you can multiply by 100, round, and then divide by 100. Like let, let's go in and see this. So like if I pick... That's 0.6667. If I go in and I say, in almost any other language. Almost any language has a rounding function. You can multiply by 100, round it to the nearest integer, then divide by 100. If you wanted it to like three places, you'd multiply by 1,000, round, and then divide by 1,000. All right. I'll post this example. I'll post the video later today. Um,